Hi everyone. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank everyone who watched my video last week on the tour portion. The feedback I received was so warm and so overwhelming that it really gave me strength to keep on going and trying to share. So, I have a dirty little secret. Since the beginning of the war, so many friends and members of our fellowship have been sending me beautiful psalms, referring me to different chapters of the psalm, saying, read this, it'll give you strength. And this psalm gives me strength, so maybe it'll be powerful for you. And you know, my kids are so good about this. My little kids, they don't go to bed with like little kid books anymore. They each fall asleep with a book of Tehillim, a book of Psalms in their little hands. They don't ask for fairy tales anymore. They just want to say Psalms together for the captives and for the soldiers. They're so good and I want to be good too. Honestly, I do. But I just haven't had it in me. I know it sounds horrible. It's like embarrassing as I'm even saying it, but that's the honest truth. I tried and I tried and I could not make it through the Psalms. I could not make it through even one. And you know, I was working on the last video that I made about Noah and his fight with Hamas, and I was reading an article in that context by Hanan Porat. I'm sure many of you have heard of Hanan, but for those who haven't, Hanan is one of the greatest heroes and role models of our time, besides her being a tremendous Torah scholar and a member of the Knesset. He was one of the first and strongest leaders of resettling Judea and Samaria after the Six-Day War, and he led the way to the establishment of Gush Etzion. And he passed away only a little more than 10 years ago in 2011. He was a tremendously righteous individual and had a huge um, impact on Jeremy and me. And he wrote many Torah articles. And last week I was reading his article about the portion of Noah. And then he finishes his article, signs his name. It's a really old article. And at the bottom, under the article, there's like a note, like a PS. I don't even know if he wrote it or how it got there. But there's this note. And it says like this. It says, look deeply at Psalm 140 as if it was written for us today in our fight against Hamas. That's what is written there. And it says, the strings of David's harp in this psalm shoot arrows at the Hamas. And I was like, stunned. There was no continuation, no explanation, no context. I felt like I'm getting like a message here that I need to read this psalm. And it's so weird because I was just thinking about how it's so hard, how weird that it's so hard for me to say the psalms. And it's like this note was buried here for many years and like unnoticed, I think. And I decided I was going to try to carefully look at this psalm. And, you know, sometimes we just read the psalms without really understanding them. But Hanan is saying, this is a psalm that speaks to our current fight with Hamas. Come back. Pray this psalm, but from a place of true kavana, true intention and understanding. So I want to look at this carefully. So it starts the first verse, Lamnatech Mizmor le David, for the conductor, a song of David. So this is a psalm written by David. Even Ezra says that David wrote this psalm while he was hiding from King Saul, from King Shaul. Now just to understand the reality that when we're living in, just to kind of share a picture into our life, when our younger kids went to bed on Shabbat dinner, after Shabbat dinner on Friday night, that's usually a time when we talk with our older teens about, you know, the Torah portion, what you do this week, just the normal stuff. But if you were in our house, you actually would have been honestly horrified. We were literally walking around our house looking for weak spots and having conversations that a person should never have with their children. Like if God forbid, a terrorist came in from this window, you go that way, I'll take the kids that way, this son should take a gun, this son should go hide. And I'm sure we were not the only ones talking about this and God forbid it should never come to pass and we have faith in Hashem and we have faith in the soldiers protecting us that this should never happen. But after seeing the massacre two weeks ago, I don't think anyone really is able to not think or plan for that kind of worst case scenario because it just happened to so many people. And this is an actual conversation and we're debating suddenly, well, is it better if a God forbid this happened to try to run into the safe room and lock ourselves in, but then be stuck inside and kind of vulnerable and concentrated together? Or should we run to the caves that are behind our house, beneath our house? And you know, our house, if you've been to the uh, Arugot Farms, you know that the Arugot Farms sits at the edge of the mountains of Zif where David actually hid in the caves that are here uh, when he was hiding from Shaul and he wrote the Psalms and we're arguing back and forth this way or that way. And one of our sons says, okay, you know what, just in case, I'll go down tomorrow to the caves and I'll put some food and water in there so that we can make a run for it if we have to without needing to carry a bag. And just to understand like the meeting of the Bible and our actual modern lives, I said to myself, oh my God, are we actually making practical real life considerations about going to hide from murderous terrorists, God forbid, in the actual caves where David himself hid from murderous Shaul? Like your ears don't believe what they hear your mouth saying. And then I started to try to think what it felt like to be David at that time. On the one hand, he's been already anointed by Samuel, by Shmuel. He knows the end of the story. He knows Hashem's will for the Jewish people is to create a kingdom of David that will be a light to the world, to build the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. And yet his reality is that he's hiding like a criminal, like an animal in a cave from someone who wants to kill him. It's so much how we feel in Israel. Like on the one hand, we've returned to our land. So many people see Hashem's hand 
in our return and with, want with all of their hearts to build a beautiful garden of Eden here in Israel to be a you know send Torah from Zion and yet here we are in a reality it feels so far away it feels so painful and as I'm studying this psalm I discover that the Sforno says that this experience in David's life in this particular psalm 140 will be repeated on a larger scale before the coming of Mashiach Rabbi Yosef Ibn Yahya actually goes even further and says that this specific psalm describes what's going to happen in the end of days and it is a divinely inspired description of what will happen Happen when evil meets its final defeat. And it says, Hashem save me from an evil man, from a man of Hamas. When I first read that, it sounded like a lot of other psalms. Oh, you know, Hashem, they're bad guys and save me. Well, why is Hanan sending us to this psalm? Well, first of all, it actually uses the word Hamas, but it doesn't only use it in this verse. Three times in this psalm does the word Hamas appear. And it's the only psalm with so many uses of the word Hamas. And that's the first thing you notice. It's like a giant neon sign. with no, There's no other psalm like this that mentions Hamas so directly. And then I looked at it even closer. When you look at the explanation of the Malbim, he says, read this psalm carefully. Every verse has a double description of evil. Each time it describes evil that's being faced in the psalm, it describes it in two ways that are not quite the same. And the verse just goes like one, two, one, the verses go one, two, one, two, like one description, a second kind of description, one and a second. And it struck me so powerfully because anyone who's following this war is first and foremost noticing that it's being fought on two fronts. First of all, there's the actual war with Hamas, like the genocidal terrorists that want to kill and kidnap and rape and burn and behead. But there's also the battle beyond the physical battle that if you were paying attention, you see is being waged by a whole other type of people. People that would have told you just a few weeks ago that the biggest problem in the world is hurting people's feelings by, you know, not respecting their pronouns or calling them the right gender or some kind of microaggression or something that, you know, doesn't feel good. Those are the people that are marching in favor of the Hamas for actual violence. The same people who said, hashtag me too, believe women that claim that they've been sexually harassed, are the same people who, when women say that they've been raped, as the Hamas records them with body cams to post live on the internet, those same people are like, mm, I haven't seen any real proof. So there's this line in the sand between people who see things with a moral compass versus both the evil doers, but also their sympathizers who dress it up in words that sound like, oh, human rights and humanitarianism. But they know that it's actually the side of evil. And right here, it appears in the words of the verse and of the words of our sages from centuries ago, guiding us for precisely this time, because the Psalm says, save me from an evil man and save me from a, from a man of Hamas, you shall guard me. The Malbim says in it, what is an evil man? An evil man is a person who's just self-interested, who wants to do things for themselves. They don't care about others. And if it, other people get hurt, that's fine. Meaning they don't mind doing evil, but evil is not the end. Their own self-interest is their end. But there's something called Ish Hamas, the Malbim says. He says, the Ish Hamas, listen to this, is the man of Hamas is not stirred by greed or glory, but enjoys perpetration of violence for its own sake. They enjoy causing pain and damage and derive greater pleasure from openly and brazenly committing violence. You know, the Nazis wanted to get rid of Jews. That was their, their end point. And the cleaner and faster they could do it, the better. And when they finished, they tried to cover up their tracks because they knew it was wrong. Never in history, the history of the world has there been a massacre so brutal as this where the perpetrators put on GoPro, GoPro cameras on their bodies so they could revel in displaying their evil. And this was written by the Malbim hundreds of years ago before the organization that would call itself Hamas was ever a twinkle in any Islamic eye. So as we read this psalm, we need to understand that David is talking about a time and that we will face these double evils. The first half of each verse is about the indirect enemies, the sympathizers, the subtle enemies that seem so sweet and nice. And the second half is about the Hamas, actual evil. And it goes on in verse 3. It says, who plotted evil things in their heart. Every day they gather to wage war. There's a type of evil that's in the heart. It's underlying anti-Semitism that we see come out somehow now. And it manages to unite LGBTQs who if they would go to Palestine, they would literally have their skin flayed. And environmentalists like Greta Thunberg and Islamist sympathizers manage to pull all these people together because in their heart they have this hatred of Jews. But they talk this nice game and they pretend to be big lovers of humanity until something happens that draws out their hearts. But then there's the actual Hamas. It calls them Yaguru Milchamot. Rashi says these are people who will make war in homes and places of settlement. How true is that? We're actually dealing with people who don't wage war on the battlefield, 
but actually go into people's homes and commit atrocities. They keep weapons in their own homes to weaponize their own children, their own hospitals and schools and kindergartens to use their children as human shields. It literally says what we are seeing before our eyes. And then verse 4 says, They wet their tongues like serpents. The venom of a spider is under their lips forever. In verse 4, the sages explain that there's a difference between a snake and a spider. A snake keeps its fangs inside its mouth. A venomous spider keeps its fangs outside its mouth. So I said there's going to be two types of venom. The type that's well hidden and dressed up. And those who like to proudly wear their venom like the Hamas on the outside. And then verse 5 says, Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of a wicked man, from a man of Hamas, it says in the Hebrew, you shall watch me, who plotted to cause my steps to slip. So now in verse 5, we ask Hashem to protect us both from the wicked and from the Hamas person. But on both of them, the verse reveals their internal motivation. It says in English, they want to make my feet slip. But that's not exactly how the sages understood the Hebrew here in the verse. The Sforno says that this is how about how Shaul chased David to the point that he had nowhere to stay in the land of Israel and he had to go to foreign exile. That's an interesting meaning here about the underlying motivation because here we know that the spiritual strength of the Jewish people is to live in the land. This is the underlying motivation is to take us away from our land. It's not about Palestinian rights or humanitarian motivation. What unites the evildoers here, the evildoers here is the desire to remove us from Eretz Israel, from the land of Israel. And then verse 6 says, Haughty man, men have concealed a snare for me. With ropes they spread a net beneath my path and lay traps for me constantly. In verse 6, we learn of two different types of traps that we'll be facing by evil. First of all, it says, haughty men have concealed a snare. There are certain types of concealed traps. You know, they interviewed Yoav Gallant, the minister of defense yesterday, and they said, why are you agreeing to let in trucks of humanitarian aid to Gaza without our hostages receiving humanitarian care? Like, why not say, yes, we'll give you humanitarian aid if you let the Red Cross see our Jewish hostages, the Jewish hostages, if you release the babies and the children that you took. If babies get supplies too, your babies will get supplies. And his answer was stunning. He said, the American government insisted on it. They conditioned supplying us with weapons and defense systems that we need on us to agree to send in those trucks to Gaza. So this is a great example of a hidden trap. Thank you, America, for your kind aid. But when it comes with a hidden condition and trap that is not obvious, unless you look closely, that is one kind of evil that the, that the psalm is talking about. But then there's a second kind of trap, which is so much more clear. It says the Hamas type of evildoers, that style of evil sets traps that are clear in sight, mokshim. The trap is visible. So well, how does a trap that's visible work? The Midrash in Esther Rabbah says this is like a trap for a thirsty wolf, that the hunter lays the trap by the watering hole. The wolf sees it, but he says, if I go down, I'm going to be trapped if I go to the water, but if I don't, I'm going to die of thirst. And he's put in an impossible position. When I read this Midrash, it struck me so strong. You know, someone from one of the kibbutzim that was overtaken by terrorists on the day of the massacre, shared screenshots of the horrible WhatsApp messages going between the neighbors as they were being slaughtered. And people are writing, I'm hiding with my children in the safe room. And what did these monsters do while they're outside? They lit the houses on fire so the safe room would fill with smoke and then they waited outside. And people are writing, I'm holding my little boy. He's suffocating from smoke. But I hear Arabic outside the door in the window. If I go out, they're going to kill me. If I stay inside, I will, will die of smoke inhalation. And the Midrash He's saying, this is the kind of trap that Hamas is going to send for you, where you're between a rock and a hard place, you have no choice. That is the trap that it is talking about. Those are the kind of evildoers we're going to be dealing with. And then verse 7 says, I said to the Lord, you are my God. Hearken, O Lord, to the voice of my supplication. And then God, O Lord, might of my salvation, you shall protect my head on the day of battle. Hashem Elohim, Az Yeshuatis, Sakota Liv Roshi, Biyom Neshek. So it's at this point that we say, Hashem, you are our God. Our only hope is that Hashem will protect our heads on the day of battle. And it's an amazing thing because it's not a secret that there's always been a lot of tension in Israel between the secular and religious and, you know, the more traditional and the more liberal. And, you know, those who say, let's be a nation like all other nations. We don't have to be so Jewish. And those saying we need to make this place a fulfillment of the prophecies of Hashem's vision for the Jewish people as a nation of priests and a light coming from Zion. And now, in this horrendous war, there are the most insane stories coming out. A professor that I studied with in university, who is about as far left progressive secular as they come, Yuval El Bashan, wrote about a case where a family, a totally secular family in Kibbutz Be'eri, were hiding, locked in their safe room, and the final 
the soldiers finally killed the terrorists and came to save them, they were too scared to open the door because the terrorists had been speaking to them in Hebrew and trying to convince them that they were IDF soldiers to open the door to kill them. And so this completely secular soldier is coming to rescue this completely secular Jewish family hiding in their safe room. And he says to them, how do I know you're not Hamas? And the secular soldier screams to him, Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hero Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. And the professor writes, when he heard that story for the first time, he understood the unbreakable link between being Israeli and being a Jew, between his military ID number and the numbers that were tattooed on our arms in Auschwitz. It's like David is teaching us that we're going to face this situation. When the Hamas is at our door, we're going to say, Hashem, Hero Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one, and then he was able to open the door. And it's worth mentioning that in all of Jewish history, there's never been such a demand for kippahs, yarmulkes, tzitzit from soldiers, to the point that there was not even enough supply for the people all over the country, to the point that now people all over the country are volunteering to make tzitzit for the soldiers. They can't keep up with the demand. They're having to make wait lists for tzitzit to give preference to first-time tzitzit wearers who have never worn tzitzit. That's how great the demand is. They've never seen so many soldiers, soldiers asking to go out to battle with a kippah and tzitzit. And that's what David is saying, you shall protect my head on the day of battle. It's going to be on that day that we're going to remember that we're Jews and that Hashem is the only one we could put our faith in. And then verse 9 says, Lord, do not grant the desires of the wicked. Do not let his thoughts succeed, for they are constantly haughty. Ten says, the numbers of those who surround me, may the lies of their lips cover them. Rosh misibai amal esfatemu yechasemu. Here it seems that we're asking Hashem not to let our enemies' plans come to fruition, that they should be smothered with their own lies. And it's interesting, the word used here to describe the thoughts of our en enemies. It says zmamo, which is the same root word used to describe false witnesses, edim zoemim, that do what false witnesses do. They claim they saw someone doing a terrible crime, like say like, oh, I saw Simon commit a murder. And they're doing that so that Simon would get the death penalty falsely. So they're actually the real killers, right? Like those false witnesses, meaning it's not just that the evil that we're going to face are going to lie, but they're going to attribute to someone, to us, the actual evil that characterizes them. Like Israel is so cautious to avoid civilian casualties, even when dealing with the most cruel people. And then our enemy claims like a perverse ac perverse accusation that Israel bombed a hospital. When we, not, the hospital was not only not bombed, but it turns out that the bomb that w blew up next to it was actually shot by the Arabs themselves. And that's just like you know, a case where their lies are actually turning around to smother them. And then 11 says, let fiery coals descend upon them. He will cast them into fire, into war, so that they will not rise. Now, this is amazing. I like this verse because it says that they're going to be destroyed inside. The Hebrew word here is their own mahamurot. In the translation, it says they'll be destroyed. Dis, uh, destroyed in war. But Mahamurot is not war. I don't know why it's translated like that. All of the sages explain that this word is something about a cave underground, like some sort of underground dwelling. And that's so strange because what we're dealing with right now is the Hamas that have actually been known to dig underground tunnels. The vision here is that those tunnels, what we're praying for is for those tunnels to turn into the terrorists' own graves. A, and then 12 says, a slander will not be established on earth, a man of violence. Uh, the evil of him will be thrust upon the other. It says, Ish lashon bal yikon ba'aretz, Ish hamas ra, sorry, uh, yitzudenu, yitzudenu le, le madchafot. Now, this is actually my favorite verse in the entire psalm, because what it's telling us here is about the ultimate justice. There is this first kind of bad. The English says it's a slanderer that will not be established, but the Hebrew does not say slander. It says, Ish lashon. The man of words will not be established. Those are clearly the first type of evildoers, the ones who speak loftily about human rights and tolerance but actually have evil in their hearts. The Ish Hamas, is the man of violence, is the man of Hamas. In this verse, it says that the evil will trap him. Who is him? The simple meaning of the verse is that the man of Hamas will actually trap and destroy that man of words, that subtle evildoer that we saw in the earlier verses, the sympathizers of evils. You know, in the, in the end, evil cannibalizes itself. I saw this video from yesterday from England. 100,000 people came out to march in England in support of the Hamas. And then some guy came out to join them with a rainbow LGBTQ flag and immediately got violently assaulted 
These people simply do not understand that they are next. If Hamas, God forbid, would ever have their way with us, they would come after those same liberal progressives that are supporting them first. It's so obvious. And this verse is saying the evildoers will actually fight against one another and destroy one another. And then 13 says, I know the Lord will perform the judgment of a poor man and the cause of the needy. Now, the resolution comes in this verse where we actually strengthen because we know that in the end, Hashem will do justice. That is the antidote to our despair and our grief. It's to strengthen ourselves in that knowledge. And this is really interesting because if you look at the Hebrew, it's fascinating. It's one of the places where we have a tradition to pronounce the word differently than it is written in the actual text. And in the actual test, text, it says, you know that Hashem will do justice. But in the pronunciation, we say, I know that Hashem will do justice. It's like David is telling us, maybe sometimes I'll falter, but you'll know. You'll know the truth and you'll raise me up. And sometimes maybe you'll forget, but I'll raise you up. There's like a play on words here where we keep each other strong. You know, a few days ago, I had this terrible breaking point and I just felt like I couldn't go on. I said to Jeremy, Hashem, forgive me. But the truth is, this is what I said to Jeremy. I, I said, if all of this turns out to be for nothing and all of this horror ends with no real change in the equation without really destroying evil, I'm out. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to be on this ride anymore. It's too perverse. It's too horrendous. I'm going to move to Montana and I'm going to make a rant. I want off of this Israel train. And Jeremy looked at me. He took me and he said, no. He goes, if we're going to go down, we're going to go out down on this ship. This is our ship. Where Israel goes down, we go down. And if that is what's going to happen, that is where we will go. Because we are not getting on, we are not on this ride because of a promise that it'll turn out okay. We are on the side of good because we are on the side of good for the sake of good. And we can't live any other way. You will not be able to live any other way. And we have to just have faith that what Hashem wants from us is to be good. And He will do what He knows is right. And it was this moment where, you know, I lost my strength and Jeremy lifted me up. And we have sometimes the opposite where I'm able to lift him up. And that's what David is hinting to us, I think, here, that sometimes we're just going to need to lift each other. And then 14 concludes, the righteous will thank your name and the upright will sit before you. Of course, the righteous will thank you, Hashem, but the righteous are not going to be alone. Being righteous is a tall order. Very few of us are perfectly righteous. But the fight is going to be the line in the sand between two sides of the world. You don't have to be a Jew to know where to stand anymore. You don't have to be particularly righteous to know where to stand anymore. It's enough to be upright. The Hebrew says yashar, someone with a straightforward common sense and morality who know, will know where to stand. And please, with the help of Hashem, we can you know, now pray for a speedy defeat of evil and for Hashem's mercy on the captives and the soldiers and for the wounded and for all of Israel.